propose to go outside and see how the wind is. It's important to know a person and to know how a person thinks to understand a person's work yeah. and what yeah. she is doing. Sure, sure. And the tradition of thinking that's behind. So my first question always is, as a child, what was your dream job? That's really interesting. I think it was to be a mechanic or something. I had no real interest early on. And then eventually I decided I wanted to be a physicist, a nuclear physicist, because I liked physics and I couldn't really understand it. But my mathematics was so weak, I think that kind of decided it. But what happened really was I was in America on December the 3rd, 1967, when Professor Christian Barnard performed the world's first human heart transplant in Cape Town at I the see. hospital. Okay. I remember and those days, yeah. I, I woke up three months later and my brain said to me, you're going to study medicine at the University of Cape Town. Oh. Before that, I honestly had no idea what I was going to do. None so at all. you are not from South Africa? I was born in Zimbabwe. Okay. That's right. And I was, my parents moved from Britain at the end of the Second World War. Yeah. They moved to Rhodesia as it was yeah. then, okay. which was a massive risk because my father was going with no job oh. and he just developed his own job in, in Zimbabwe. So, Entrepreneur. Yeah, so he was very brave yeah. to, yeah. in 1946, to go with my sister yeah. and my mother to this new country. And so, it's, so it was, so I think I got some of his sort of, his flair. And courage. Yeah, probably. Because yeah. said it needs courage to think the way you do. Yes. Yeah. But he he was known as being revolutionary in his business. What did he do? <laughs> May I ask? Well, I hate to say it, but not hate to say it because I respected him a lot. But he was in the tobacco industry. He was a tobacco exporter. Okay. Yeah, but and in a, those days, yeah, smoking was, was normal. Exactly. And as you know, in times of war, yeah, and. People don't think about no, health no, in right. this way. It's a different story. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. You have a f different focus on life. Precisely. Yeah. yeah. So the, my my second question is already uh, answered. Then, when it occurred to you to become a scientist, yeah. probably it's a different question because to study different. medicine has nothing yeah. to do exactly. with being a scientist. Exactly. So I ask this question. So that you you're absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, when people think medicine science, it's it's not about science. It's nothing to do with science. It's about it's about practical management yeah. of patients, making a diagnosis, and then managing a problem, and just receiving receiving perceived wisdom. And just continuing with yeah. it. What I I'd started rowing actually, and then I started running in my first few years at medical school, and then I just suddenly realised I was interested in endurance sports, not in not in medicine. Okay. And I always make the joke that I'm probably the worst doctor who ever graduated because I didn't know how to treat one condition. I, I refused <laughs> to learn the really? drugs. I absolutely refused. It just wouldn't stick in my head. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And. Um, all these long names, because I didn't think that that's the way we should be treating patients. I thought there was lifestyle and so on. And so with, during my medical training, I decided I wanted to study sports medicine because I thought the athletes were not getting proper mm -hmm, care. Mm -hmm. And I also saw that prevention was much more important than treatment. And so that became my focus. And then I realized I was much more interested in finding out for myself than from learning from a textbook. I simply couldn't sit down and learn the textbook and become a physician. Because I, I can't, I can't learn a thousand causes uh -huh. of tem body temperature uh -huh. elevation uh -huh. in illness. I I can't. I'll learn two things and that's it. But the rest I can't. If I'm not going to use the information, uh -huh. I don't want to have it in my head. But you finished your studies. Yeah, I did finish my studies. <laughs> you were stubborn enough. <laughs> no, to that's do right. So. <laughs> and then I did my internship my year in the hospital. Yeah. And that convinced me that I wasn't cut out for that. Yeah, I was definitely cut out for science. And fortunately, fortunately, I met mm -hmm. this wonderful scientist, Professor Lionel Opie, and he influenced me dramatically. And I just, I sort of, I modeled myself on him to, to a great extent. Yeah. So this was my question, did you have a mentor? So he was yeah. already... Yeah. So... I, I had this sort of, my hero was Professor Chris Barnard. Yeah. But I learned in later life that he, he fell short because he loved himself rather more Quite yeah, he was very vain, and that was a real problem. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he was probably the best known doctor in the entire world. Mm -hmm. 
and he could have done so much more, but he fell short. Mm. He could have really advanced cardiac surgery and medicine in South Africa, but unfortunately he fell short. Mm. But Lionel Opie was, for me, he was just such a top scientist. Can you uh, characterize him a little bit? Yeah. What I learned from him was this incredible ability to know the, know the literature and to read and read and read and read everything that was in the literature. And also to assess it. Yeah, and absolutely. And then to come up with hypotheses after mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But I think that was the thing I learned from him. You, you never stop reading. Mm -hmm. And I still remember that he would disappear with hundreds of journals into the library and come out with all the photocopies. And then they'd go into his office, and I never found how this office just got fuller and fuller and fuller. <laughs> <laughs> when you talk about reading, is it a very broad spectrum of things? Is it also related, I mean, is it, or is it connected to your, the questions you want to answer? Yeah, I, it, it absolutely depends. So I do read broadly, but then when I get focused in on a question, then I just read about that. So currently I'm really interested in nutrition, so I'm just reading everything about nutrition. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> no, because I mean, but this is not yeah. part of. It's not about me. It's about you. Yeah. I, just at the end, perhaps I can yeah, ask sure. you some question yeah. about this. Now you you are considered as a scientist. Today you consider yourself as a scientist. In the beginning, when you started out with this career, you had probably an idea of yeah. what a scientist yeah. is. How did it change yeah. during all these years? Absolutely. Um, I was interested in promoting sports science and sports medicine in South Africa. And so it was more the clinically applied mm -hmm. aspect that I thought was important. And so originally, I probably studied sports medicine, but again, it was didactic. You know, it was just learning what, how do you treat this condition, that condition, the other condition. And then slowly, as I started to do, I, I think what happened was that this that the questions had to be applied. For example, with Lionel Opie, he was studying heart attacks in marathon runners. And what happened was he, he wrote a letter to the New England Journal of Medicine saying that South Africans had already, he'd already proved that a, a marathon runner had had a heart attack. And he published it. And then the people whose theory he was trying to disprove, and the theory was that if you ran a marathon, you'd never die of a heart attack. They said, no, Lionel, you've got to provide the autopsy evidence. And he couldn't provide the evidence because mm -hmm. there was no autopsy. Mm -hmm. And I think that suddenly made me realize, okay, this is what science is. Science is actually providing the real evidence. And it's not bogus mm -hmm. evidence. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. so, uh, so we were able then in the next two or three years to, to find patients who in fact died from heart disease where we could document mm -hmm. that autopsy. And we published that in the New England Journal of Medicine. So I slowly was getting the idea of what science is all about. And then the, 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 the patient I spoke about today in 1981, where she developed hyponatremia during the Comrades Marathon, and she wrote to me, and then I decided, okay, I'm gonna prove what causes this. And so then I just tried, I began slowly to understand what science is. So this was a breakthrough in some it, yeah, yeah, it was definitely yeah. a breakthrough. Yeah. And I slowly began to realize the idea of hypotheses and testing and then eventually disproving hypotheses. Because and this is actually what we don't learn when we study medicine. No, not at all. Not at all. No not idea all. about no. these things. Like and that was, I was so fortunate to work for five years with, with Lyle Opie in a laboratory. Well, is, was it due to him and you that South Africa at Cape Town University became one of these spots? <laughs> doing research in, 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 in sports. I, I definitely, he put me on yeah, the right track. Yeah, and then yeah. I think I was fortunate. It was, you see, what was interesting, I decided all along that I had to have the public on my side. Mm -hmm. So when I wrote Law of Running the first mm -hmm. time in 1985, I wrote it, in fact, to, A, to explain to my father why I loved running, because he didn't understand at all. And it, it took him a long time to learn. Mm -hmm. But it was also to express to the general public that science is important. And that's what I pushed for the last 30 or 40 years, is the public has to understand what's the role of science. And the, the thing is that South Africans are mad about sport, like many European countries. Mm -hmm. And I knew that if I could prove that, that science could help athletes perform in different sports, that the public would buy in and they would mm -hmm. say, oh goodness, that's, then mm -hmm. science of sport is important. Among the scientific community, do you feel like an heretic that <laughs> was somebody crossing forbidden border? Forbidden border? 
Yeah, one of the beauties of, of living in South Africa is we're so far from Europe and we're so far from North America that it doesn't really matter. And in fact, I get praised in South Africa for being a heretic because uh-huh. they like people to come up and stand up to the Americans and the Europeans. Because I remember, as I said in my talk, that we have this inferiority complex mm-hmm. about America. Even Europe has this inferiority yes. complex. So we bow to America. And, and when you're sitting so far away, it's great because you can just take on these, these dragons and slay them. And that, their dragons don't even yeah. know they're being attacked. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. So it's good to be far away and not yeah. being engulfed yeah. by this kind yeah. of pressure. Also. Exactly. And because I publish and publish yeah, and buy, yeah. and the university gives you yeah. this pressure. Exactly, and and the the system is so biased towards sustaining itself in the United yeah. States that that the reviewers will only publish stuff that they that fits their paradigm. And so sitting outside it, it's beautiful. The, the other beauty I had was that I trained as a medical doctor, not as an exercise scientist. So when I came into exercise science, I had absolutely no bias whatsoever. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what was right. Mm-hmm. And I just read and read and read and then mm-hmm. came to those conclusions. Mm-hmm. If I'd been trained, I'm, I'm not sure I would have questioned. For example, uh, let's take a simple example where gastric ulcers are caused by, we were taught they were caused by acid secretion and so on. So I never questioned that. But, but if I hadn't been trained, maybe I would have asked the question, actually it might be bacteria. So, so that's my point. I, I was trained as a doctor, so I'm far more rig- rigid in my thinking about medicine, because that's what people told me, this is the truth. Whereas in the exercise science, I taught myself. So, if you were not what you are today? Um, professional surfer. Ah, <laughs> that was this the, is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I never, had the, I never had the bravery to do it, but uh, that was a sport uh-huh. I always loved doing. Okay. And I think that also, because it was a complete break from from the conventional sports, where you could do your own thing and measure your own success in your own terms. Yeah. So that was, and I had a great, uh, I've just been amazed how what people can do on, on surfboards and on waves. That, uh, that's probably what I would have liked to have done, but I would have got bored with it very quickly and that, that wouldn't have worked. Yeah. So you love variety. Yeah, no, definitely. Although I can be very focused on what I do. I do enjoy variety, that's great. What, what role plays running in your life? Running is critical. It was, it was really what made my life, I think, because when I started running, I discovered that I was really designed for it. And so not designed physically for it, but designed mentally for it. And today I still I, I try to run every day. And the interesting thing is I, I run as hard as I possibly can every day. And so I don't just go out and jog. It's like it's a race. And I actually can push myself harder in training than probably than I do in races now. So I just, I love the freedom of going out and, and running and running really hard and recording all my data on my Garmin and then downloading it and checking performance and seeing how I performed last year, this day and so on. So, so that gives me a great satisfaction. Come on. And now, easy one. May I ask you, what's your favorite book? Yeah, what's my? I've got so many. Um, yeah, I was going to say Beyond a Boundary, which is a book about cricket and how how cricket defines a sort of morality that develops in and how the British use cricket to to develop this morality. Or oh, that's what it kind of was was about. Um, what book do I have next to my bed? At the moment, I have about 70 books next to my bed, so it's not, it's not which book would I take if I was lost. On an island, yeah. yeah. I think the best writer was George Sheehan on running, so I'd probably take one of his books. And, and I think probably it would be Running and Being, which is sadly people don't read those books because he was just a genius writer. So and, and, he's, and so people really need to go back and read what he said because he was so far ahead of everyone. Favorite music? My favorite music is I'm completely stuck in the '60s. I just I just listen to the old stuff that I listened to in the '60s, and my wife loves classical music, but I never got onto that. I'm okay. still with the Beach Boys and the Beatles and the the Four Seasons and uh, Great. <laughs> sorts of groups. Last question: What's your favorite color? 
Uh, probably blue, which I'm not wearing today, but probably blue. So.